We're going to take off today in uh, Matthew chapter 2. We're going to talk about worship for just a little bit. And uh, it's amazing how that God just leads and guides our lives. We think sometimes things happen for uh, just coincidence. You know, it just that's just how it worked out. I don't believe in coincidence, uh, to be honest with you. I believe that God brought you here this morning, not by coincidence, not just because you happened to spend the night with a friend last night and uh, and you just thought, hey, I'm going to go to church with them since mom and dad's not going to pick me up until after lunch. It's not just a coincidence that you're here today. God has something special for you, for you as an individual. It's not just coincidence this morning that you woke up and your husband said, hey, we probably should get around and get the kids going because we really need to go to church today. It's not by coincidence that that uh, that you're here. You might need something in your life or maybe you need to give something to somebody else. But there's a reason that you're here this morning. And that's to worship God with everything that you are. In Matthew chapter 2, it really tells the story of, of Christmas. Um kind of finishes it up a little bit. There's some falsehoods, I think, in in how we celebrate when it comes to to this chapter um, because we see nativity scenes set up uh, all around. And I think it's just more convenient that we add these guys in at that time at the birth of Jesus. But I don't believe that these people or these men that we'll talk about here uh, took place. They didn't come in a cave or in a barn and and uh, give gifts to, to Jesus. This was sometime after that those wise men would come and um, they would worship him. So let's just read together in uh, Matthew chapter 2, starting with verse 1. It said, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Some eight, nine hundred miles away, these men saw a star over Jerusalem and they came so that they might be able to worship him. So when King Herod heard this, he he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had uh, called together all the, the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, where is the Christ supposed to be born? Where, where is he supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. And this is what was said previous to that birth. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come ruler, a ruler who will uh, be a shepherd of all my people. They're talking about Jesus there. Out of this place, out of Judah, will come Jesus. And he will be the shepherd of all of those uh, people of Israel. So then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the the exact time um, the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go and worship him. We all know that Herod did not want to worship Jesus. He just wanted to find out his location. But he sent the Magi uh, on ahead to try to, uh, kind of a smokescreen, if you will, to be able to try to get closer to that place. And after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and they worshipped him. Then they they opened their uh, treasures presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. These guys 
from afar off see a star in the distance, and they know that there's something special about that. You do a little bit of study on these men. They, they look at the stars a lot. They, they have a tendency to, um, to try to draw something from that astrology uh, part of them. They're, they're not necessarily godly men, but when they saw that star, they knew something was really, really special about it. And they had heard prophecy before that out of this area, there's going to be a Savior that is born. So that when they seen this star, they decided that they would go and they would try to seek out and they would try to find this, this baby, if you will. But an eight or 900 mile journey isn't like today when you just jump in your car fill it up with gas, and you say, hey, I'm going to go to Dallas today, or I'm going to go to Kansas City today, or I'm going to go, you know, let's, let's just, and you, it's not like that. It took a lot of preparation. Everybody says that there were three wise men. They say that because there was three gifts. These men normally traveled in packs of 12, is what they did. So there might not have been three, there might have been many of these men that would come and they would try to find out where the Savior was born and be able to see Him for themselves. I want to ask you this morning, how far will you go to worship God? There's signs and there's wonders and there's things that take place in our life and sometimes we think, oh, that was just coincidence, but it's not. And sometimes God puts things in our path or before us so that we have these little bits, these little nuggets, if you will, a, a moment of time that we know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, God is moving or God is working on our behalf. Sometimes that's in tragedy. Sometimes that's in blessing. But God sees fit at times to be able to give us those moments so that we know for sure that the Savior that we serve, the Savior that we talk about, the, the, the Christ child is real. These men, these wise men, these, these men that, that uh, would travel so far just to see his face, they didn't send a message, they didn't, just, they didn't send somebody on their behalf, they wanted to know for sure that he was the true Messiah. So, how far are you willing to go to be able to see him, to be able to meet him? To be able to talk to him face to face in the future. How, how long or how far are you willing to travel to make sure that that takes place? We all know it's a free gift. We all know because I'm going to say most or several of us in this, in this place have had that moment in our life where we said, I want you, God, to come into my heart. I want you, God, to be a part of my life. That's, that's no secret. But the problem with that is, is from that point on, the journey or the path that we travel sometimes isn't easy. Sometimes it's rocky and rough, and sometimes our flesh prevails over the spirit man inside of us. So how far are you willing to go? For some of us, we're willing to give our whole lives. It's taken a long time for us to get there. It doesn't happen overnight. It seems like God just continues to sanctify us and change us and, and mold us and make us. But are you, are you willing to go through that process? Because that process is not pretty. That process is, is difficult at times. It's up and down hills and around mountains and, and over mountains. And, and, and there's times where you come upon... Uh, things that slow you down in that process. Maybe like Herod, when he's talking to these wise men, and he says, will you go and will you see where that, that, that child is? And when you find him, you come back to me. Because I want to worship him too. Not everybody in this world wants you to worship God. They don't mean, they don't mean bad. They don't mean harm on you. But the enemy seems to use people to drive a wedge in between you and the relationship that you have with your God. 
they drive a wedge and make you doubt and make you think things that really aren't the case. Not everybody wants you to worship God. And I'm asking you this morning, are you willing to go to great lengths to make sure that Christ is a part of your life and a part of your family's life? Because these guys here, ones that really didn't even serve God at the time, they went and they sought Him out, they found Him, and when they saw Him, they, they knew that He was the one that could change their life forever. I can only talk about Jesus to you. I can use the words that He has inspired and He's given us to speak. I can talk about stories. Oh, can I tell you stories? You know? I can be as creative as, as, as possible on this stage to try to bring things that are, are fun and exciting and, and things to make you think and, and things that, that will uh, to help illustrate what this message is. But until you come face to face with Him, until you have a moment or an encountering with, with Jesus, it's really just all talk. It, it, it's just really a guy on a stage saying something. Until you experience for yourself, that's the moment that things start to change in your life. That's the moment that eternity is secure for you. And I hope that you're willing not just to go part way, but to go all the way until you experience him this morning. Do you know what John and this band was trying to do? They were not trying to sing a song over and over and over again. You knew the song after the first verse in the chorus. You could have sang it without any words on the screen. You could have... It was simple. They weren't trying to teach you something. They were trying to give you a moment in time where everything else in this world could fade away. To give you a moment in time where you didn't have to worry about where something was going to come from or how you were going to do something or, or who was mad at you or, or what you had to do tomorrow at work. Oh, tomorrow is Monday. For a moment, you could just get by, by yourself, just you and Him. And it doesn't matter if you sound okay it doesn't matter if you're singing loud or you're singing softly or you're just singing to yourself. But there's a moment there that you can experience God, that you can come face to face with Him. And when, when that experience happens, when you come to a place and God comes to that place, things begin to change in your life. You're exposed. And you start thinking about, God, I've done a lot of great things in my life, and then I've done a lot of just crazy things in my life too. And if you'll have me, I'm here just to give you everything that I am. I'll exalt you. I will lift you up. If you'll let me out of this, this dirty old body, if you'll let me lift you up and glorify you, I will. With everything that I have, with every fiber of my being, when I see you face to face in that moment, I will lift you up, and I will glorify you. Because you are my God. And you created me. We are wonderfully made. And He desires nothing more than for you to give everything over to Him. How far are you willing to go? And once you get there, what do you have to offer Him? These men gave their very best to that child that day. They gave something to him. Monetarily, it was expensive. It was, it was something that was worth something. They didn't bring him 
something cheesy. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't go somewhere and pack up some cheap gift and bring it and say, by the way, you're the, the Messiah, the one that'll give us eternal life, the one that'll save us from our own self. And by the way, I bought you a cheap gift on the way here. I brought you my very best today. I brought you what means the most to me. And that's my gift to you. God, that's what I give to you is my very best. And let me say, we do not do a good job sometimes in giving him our very best. Oh, it's enough. It's more than what they gave. It's better than how they worship. It's, it's, it's better than. It's enough. But let me just tell you this morning, God doesn't want just enough. Just a, a, a little bit. When you go out and buy a new car, this is how it works, right? You go to the, to the dealership and, and you, you point out the smallest little compact car that you can find that has no accessories on it whatsoever. You know, it, it barely has an engine in it. It's like a three-cylinder. And, and when you start it up, you know, you can, it sounds like a weed eater. You walk up on that car and you say, this is what I want. This, this is... The, this is the car that I want. No accessories, stripped down model. You know, it's got some little 13-inch tires on it. it, it it's going to go 50 miles. But, you know, that's not what you want. When you go onto the car lot, you pick out the shiniest, biggest, fastest, thing with the most accessories that it has, you want it to roll up, you want it to push up, you want it to roll back, you want it to show you how it does, you want it to park itself. You ain't bringing your wife home that little three-cylinder car and saying, baby, look what I got for you. You don't put a bow around that. You don't wrap that up. That's something you park around the block and you say, hey, if we need to, we can borrow my friend's car. What you bring home is the very best that you can afford and the very best that, that you have. And you say, hey, I got this for you. And that's all God's asking of us. He said, I don't, I don't want anything else but you and you the, the way you are. Just the way you are. Don't change a bit. Don't think for one second God wants to change your personality or change the way you dress. He, he, he just wants to get in and for you to love him so much that you worship him. It's the best gift you could give God this Christmas. Is yourself. Say, I'm already saved. I'm already saved. I'm not talking about that. I, I'm talking about all of you. You that follow him. You that worship him. You that know the way is what it says in the New Testament. Everything that you have, make sure that you're following Him with it and giving it to Him. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2, it says, Set your minds on things, ab things above and not on things of this world. So as we go into Christmas, it's only a few days away. I want it to be different for your family this year. I don't want it to just to be another time of gift giving. You're willing to go a long ways for those, those things. I know. We do. And we, and we want it to be the best that we can afford for our children. And we'll, we'll charge it if we have to. We'll get an extra job if we need to to make sure that they have the best. But I think the best lesson we can teach our family this season is not only that, 
But we can give him our best too. And that we will not forget about that. And we'll put our mind and we'll concentrate on things that really, really matter. Because I'll tell you this much. You can buy the best present in the world for your kids or for the person that you love. And in a short period of time, that, that thing that made you so happy will fade. And no longer will it be worth much. What you have with Christ will last for an eternity. I want to know how far you're willing to go to serve Him. And I want to know today what you're willing to give up when you get there.